At Oslo, we had a good facilitator. We had a US sponsor in the background and then in the foreground. We had supporters in the international community. We had a context, namely resolutions 242 and 338, the concept of land for peace. We had leadership <coughs> among elites and public opinion. There was a critical mass of support on both sides. In other words, we did have a favorable alignment to start a process that could be successful. With hindsight, of course, there's the suspicion as to the ultimate motives of the stronger party. There's the vagueness in the text of the agreement. There's the scope that that agreement left for spoilers and men of violence to interrupt the process. We had hesitant implementation, the idea of there being no sacred dates, for example. We have the, had the pernicious settlement growth. We had the weakness of the Palestinian authority under Arafat. But I do believe that it was right to have tried. There are, of course, many different ways of expressing the essential incompatibility of Jewish and Palestinian claims in settling the underlying issues now, the rights of two peoples to self-determination and statehood, borders, security, Jerusalem, refugees, settlements. One is the idea of the twice-promised land. Another is that the conflict is not between a right side and a wrong side, but between two sides with extensive right on their side. But with the strength of one party so much greater than that of the other, uh, we have this stalemate. We have no fair compromise achievable at present. I would suggest that since 1967, the history of the diplomacy and of the actions of the parties can be seen as a search for a new or disrupting influence that would break that stalemate. Facilitation, in other words, diplomacy has been tried, and on the other hand, parties have sought decisive action which would overwhelm the resistance of the other side or shift the outcome in favor of one side or the other, while, of, of one side, while pacifying or subduing the other. I think it's worth taking a little time just to break down some of those uh, tactics or strategies used. The Palestinians have emphasized international law, international humanitarian law, self-determination, the UN Security Council context. They've sought to mobilize regional and international political support. Uh, some have used armed struggle or terrorist methods. Israel has established facts on the ground, used obscure laws or modern laws to promote annexation and settlement. They've used the violence of occup occupation, repression, control of the economy, and blockade. If we hit them hard enough, they must understand that they have to concede. They've exploited the, the United States alliance. They've promoted one-sided political solutions. In the early days, ideas of autonomy, Bantustans, which Elan mentioned, or Jordan is Palestine. None of these have provided the solution to prevail over the other side. The United States, for its part, has tried both facilitation and more forceful methods. Uh, Camp David, the roadmap, Annapolis, the Kerry Initiative, all examples of facilitation. And now we have disruptive tactics, what Kushner has called the creative destabilization, the so-called taking Jerusalem off the table, strong arming the Palestinian Authority by cutting off assistance and the other measures they've taken that are so wrong. Then the fourth party, the international community, uh, largely confined itself to exhortation, to declarations. Uh, we've got at least the Arab uh, Peace Initiative. The EU has made its positions quite clear. Uh, the French tried an international conference approach. 
But we know that these have been largely sidelined, all of them, uh, and we know that there are certain things that the Europeans, amongst others, won't do. They won't use their economic weight. So turning to today, we have a litany of obstacles. We don't have that favorable alignment as in 1991 to 1993. The leaderships are not in place. Political support in the domestic base of either side is insufficient. There are regular provocations preventing the re-emergence of minimum levels of trust. And unlike in the late 1980s, with the rise of the idea of two states, uh, co common ground in constructive ideas at present is in very short supply. The Israeli appetite for land is undiminished. Immunity for Israel is still intact. Religion is being used and misused. Dehumanization of the other side persists, especially but not exclusively by the stronger party. The facilitator is partial. I'm sure we're going to hear more of that. But at least the facilitator has grasped, the United States has grasped two lessons from the past. First is that presidential commitment is required. And secondly, that a comprehensive, properly presented proposal in one go is better than the incremental approach. I don't think this president is going to succeed. But those two principles, I believe, hold true for the future when we might get a better United States government. Palestinians, of course, are divided. I believe that their leadership is a partner for peace, but it is weak. So if there's no clear way forward, if the current US effort is destined to fail, what do we conclude? Should we seek to promote the idea of one state? I mean, that is tempting, the idea of giving Israel a deadline, either end the occupation or grant equal rights in one state. I believe this is pie in the sky and would lead to continued and perhaps even worse oppression of the Palestinians. For me, the binding argument that we should still persist with the idea of two states is the vision of ultimate reconciliation, which I don't abandon. Reconciliation requires equality. Coexistence requires justice. And justice requires independence. That equality, that eventual mutual respect can only proceed from Palestinian statehood. So what about policy here in London and in other European capitals? I pass over the fact that here in London we are hamstringing ourselves by separating ourselves from the larger bloc of the European Union. But still, my fundamental proposal would be that the British government should develop a policy, not just a position. The difference is that with a policy you advocate a set of steps to try and get you to where your policy says you should go. At present, we have almost entirely a reactive position taking by the British government uh, with uh, the least possible surface exposed based on the idea that the problem is not soluble, so why put yourself in the firing line right now? I mean, there are elements in the British government's position which is right that we should stand fast on Jerusalem and on refugee status and on supporting UNRWA, that we should continue to expand ideas for a fair compromise. But we do need to go considerably further as a country. First area, enforcement of international law, enforcing humanitarian law, the Geneva Convention. And by enforcement, I mean promising due and proportionate consequences for breaches. We need a change of tone. 
more on justice, more on acknowledging the value and the ideas of the Israeli peace camp. Secondly, we need to absorb the lessons of past diplomatic attempts, and there is excellent work being done this by, on this by Chatham House. I would love to have been a part of it, but I haven't. Uh, but, yes, I'm very nearly there. But we do need to find new ideas for promoting and underpinning a settlement. And my own view, having heard Yossi Balin recently, is that an Israeli-Palestinian confederation could be one of those. And finally, of course, recognition of the state of Palestine. This is a legal right, not as the, pa the British government sees it at present, a card to be played in negotiations. Playing it now would help reassert the two-state solution and confirm Palestinian sovereignty over Gaza, East Jerusalem, and the West Bank. And I believe it would help those in Israel and Palestine who still call for two states. Thank you.